good evening and good afternoon. Welcome back to Building Literacy and True Identity here with Denise M. Walker. I'm your founder, author, teacher, mentor, and podcaster of Project Hope Youth Institute. Here at Project Hope Youth Institute, we are teaching leadership, true identity in Christ, and literacy. Not just biblical literacy, but literacy in general as we teach English language arts, reading, comprehension skills, and we make Christ the center focus and the missing piece of our puzzle. Your materials that you will need today is the, your journal, your pencil, Bible, and a dictionary, um, online or paperback. Our learning target for today's lesson, which is Lesson 3 from Genesis 1, 11 through 25, the learning target is to understand God as the creator, understanding God as the creator. So we're continuing with that learning target. And also we've added another essential question. The first one is how did the world come into existence? That's the one we've been working on. And the second one is, what is God's purpose for mankind and the living creatures? Our key vocabulary for Genesis 1, 11 through 25, of course, is God, create, kind, and we'll talk about that word, um, fruitful and blessed. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Genesis 1, 11 through 25 is pretty lengthy, but it has pretty much just one central focus. And so we will begin reading um, Genesis 1, 11 through 25 from the New King James Version. All right. Verse 11 says, Then I said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that you see, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, on the earth, and it was so. Verse 12, And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 13, So the evening and the morning were the third day. Verse 14, then God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Verse 15, and let them be for light in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Verse 16, then God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Verse 17, God said, let God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of heaven. Verse 21, so God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its time, kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Last two. Verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. Verse 25, and God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, 
and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. So let's look closer at these verses. As you can see, God is still creating in these particular verses. In verses, um, chapter 1, verse 11 through 25, God is still creating. He laid the foundation. Now he's prepping the land. So a couple notes here that I wrote is God had laid the foundation in the previous verses. Now he is preparing the earth to be inhabited. The earth was formless and void at first. Then God obviously had a plan. He separated the waters and divided them to make heaven, earth, and the seas. So that's where he laid the foundation. Now he begins to bring forth grass, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the living creatures. So pausing for a second, we have a question. The question is, why do you think God created the animals in the order that he did? So when we look back at the animals, why do we think God created them in the order that he did? And I was just curious. I just wondered why. Um, and you can write that in your journal. Just curious as to why you think God created the animals in that order. These verses talk about God creating the different species according to their kind. So we go into that part of the scripture where it, it goes deeper into according to their kind. You hear that over and over in these scriptures. And the word kind in scripture means species, groups of living organisms that belong in the same created kind. So again, the word kind as it continues to say over and over and over in these particular verses. The word kind in scripture means species, groups of living organisms that belong in the same created kind or group. Um, the question that I came up with, as I was looking and studying these particular scriptures, I came up with the question, if there were no creator or designer, um, then how would this look? How would this look? Because Genesis 1, 11 through 25 says that God created them according to their kind. So he created them in groups, in um, different organisms, um, living organisms in groups. Um, and they serve a different purpose. So as many people try to get us to believe or think or get you all to think about um, that there's no creator, if there were no creator, designer, then how would this really look? Well, I'd like to answer my own question so that as you are writing and thinking about it, i tell you what I thought about it. I, my answer was there would be no order. There would be absolutely no order. Think about the various kinds of species, fruit, vegetables, their purpose, and how they are designed. Could this have just happened? And my answer to that is no. Um, there will be no order. And what I mean by it, it could possibly be where my ears would be, where my mouth is. Um, but God designed me for a purpose. He designed the animals here in this particular scripture for a purpose, the animal groups. They all serve a purpose on the earth. And so we have to keep that in mind. That word kind is so very important um, because God had a purpose for every single one of the thousands of animals that he created. He designed and insects and birds and um, all kinds of creatures that he created. He has a purpose for them. Okay, so let's think about that. The other thing that um, this scripture points out is it shows us that the grass, the herb, and the fruit trees have seed in themselves. They continue to say that, that the seed was in themselves. So it's a science question, um, science type question, um, but it answers our question again about the creation of God, about God creating and um, him being the creator. 
So the question was, why do you think God created them with their seed within themselves? Why do you think God created them with their seed within themselves? And what is the purpose of a seed? What's the purpose of a seed? And when I wrote this question, I was like, this is awesome. I just, it just makes you, it's simple, but it just makes you think so much more about who God is and um, his design. And uh, the answer for seed here is something that um, causes reproduction, capable of developing into another such plant. So a seed is something that reproduces and is able to go into another such plant, such as itself. So why did God do that? Why, why did God create them with seed within themselves? Well, we, we already know. We know the answer to that. First of all, um, this portion of the scripture again shows the truth of God as the creator. He, God is not, it's not an assembly line. And on the assembly line, if you picture, I don't know, you all um, can picture someone making some toys on an assembly line. Well, there are workers on an assembly line and they make the toys and they have to make the toy over and over and over and over and over. So, they, they they look alike. They're the same toy, the same iPhone, but they have to keep making it over, keep making it over and over and over again. God is God. He doesn't have to do that. He made it where those plants reproduce, develop another such plant. Same with humans. He said, be fruitful, and we're going to that, and multiply. He created us where he don't have to go back to the assembly line. Say, well, wait a minute, the arm fell off. Let's go back. Let's fix this. No, he's, he is God, and he's, this shows his power even more, his power even more. And we know from reading this particular scripture that no human being, no man, no such false deity um, or false idol that people may say that doesn't exist or, or couldn't, couldn't um, keep themselves from dying, they can't be the ones that made the seed within themselves. It has to be the self-existent one, the Lord God Almighty, um, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so this scripture just, um, this particular term from these scriptures just really blessed me because we know that God is not like the assembly line at the job. Um, where we got to keep making the next toy. And then if it pop off or go, wait a minute, we got to get that piece and put it back on. No, God made us good. And so, and, and we're going to talk about that word as well. So that, this particular section of the scripture really, really blessed me. And then the scripture, um, verse 14, begins to talk about the light that God gave upon the earth. So what were these lights? Well, that cricket talked about three, sun, the moon, and the stars. It didn't say the sun. It didn't say the moon. And why? Because at those times, in that time in history, people worshipped the sun. And they worshipped, I believe that's why it wasn't specifically spoken of, the sun and the moon. And so um, it just kind of said that God made those lights so that we know that God is greater than any sun and any moon and anything else. And, um, but that's the, from looking at the commentary of the theologians, we understand that the sun and the moon um, were things that they worshipped. And so um, in Genesis, in that section of Genesis, they called them lights that God made. And so we have to keep that in mind. So when people begin to talk about worshipping the sun, no, the sun can't do anything for us. The sun can't do anything for itself. Um, it was created by God, and so was the moon. So as we go on, um, the verse also tells us God's purpose for these lights. The sun to rule the day. It didn't say to rule as God. It said to rule the day, to bring light, to shine light. That's what it means. The moon to rule the night. Dividing the day from night, giving the earth light. And also, it goes on to say that, um, to tell the difference in the seasons, the days, and the years. 
And so the, the purpose of those particular lights that were placed on the earth. So my question, of course, I had a question. And the question says, what would happen if we didn't have the sun or the moon? What would happen if we didn't have the sun or the moon? And this is one I want you to write out and write in your journal and really answer. Be honest. What would happen if we didn't have the sun and the moon? Do some research. Do some research. And, my, and of course, I have my answer. My answer is we would have a big problem. One, the sun, if we only had the sun or we didn't have the sun, we would freeze to death. Um, and um, the moon, um, at night, the moon gives us that light. That It's not a bright light, but it gives us that light in the, in the sky. And, and also we know that the moon has something to do with the, um, the um, tides and, and the water of what God has um, placed on the earth as well. So God set all of it with such a great purpose. It's so beautiful the way he designed everything. to have such a purpose. And then we know that it's, the sun shine all the time at 100 degrees. We would, we would be not so well. Um, we would have some struggles if we only had the sun. So God knew. And then even with the stars and um, in the sky and helping to light the sky at night, and that's just a simple reason. But then if we do our research and, and, and know the purpose and what's going on and how the sun and the moon and the stars um, their purpose and, and their design and what they do, um, it would amaze us at the beauty of God. It, it would really amaze us. So there are a few other phrases that are important to us here as well. And these were some um, very, very awesome phrases that I just, I, again, this section has really blessed me. Um, First, it was God blessed them, the species. He blessed them. He blessed them. And then he said something. He said, be fruitful and multiply. So he commanded them to go forth and be fruitful and multiply. So me, being loving words and, and, and wanting to know what they mean, I went and I looked up blessed. And the word blessed here means to salute to favor, to pronounce prosperity. So let's think about an army salute here for a second. I went and I looked up um, some research of an army salute. And um, that word salute, when, it, when we look up in the Strong's Dictionary of Bless, um, I thought about an army salute. And so I looked at what it means, and it means a gesture of acknowledgement when arriving or departing. So God had created the animal life on the scene, and he was given command to depart, go forth, and be fruitful and multiply. That means he wasn't going to have to come back and redo them and make them over. He just blessed them and saluted them and said, go for it in prosperity. And from that time from Genesis until now, God never has to remake the animals or the plant life. He It has done as he blessed it to do. And so another thing that I thought about, I didn't write it on our PowerPoint, and um, you can, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel or you subscribe to my page, you will be able to get the visual that I'm reading from, um, the visual with the activities and everything in it so that you can go back and study this particular um, verses here. And so one of the other things that, that came to my mind, um, they were sent forth to complete, complete God's instructions or purpose for their lives. And even the plants, they have a purpose. Everything God made has a purpose. And again, his command was be fruitful and multiply. So as we think about that particular portion, we think about when in the world um, where people 
um, practice certain things that they want to practice. And um, for example, if we want to um, be very, very technical, um, one area where we have to be very careful is when we say that um, when God created man and woman, and we'll get into that in our next lesson, and he's going to command them to be fruitful and multiply. Anything that does not does not uh, multiply and not fruitful. So things that hinder the reproduction process is not of God. Anything that hinders the reproduction process is not of God. So we have to remember that as young people and even as adults, we have to teach our young people that no homosexuality is not of God, not what God has said. And so we have to be careful in that area. Uh, we love, we walk in that love of God, but God commanded us to be fruitful and multiply. And he set that standard and he set that purpose in us already. So nobody, we don't have to try to make it fit and try to go and do, do it our way. He already did it. And it is so. He blessed it and said he saluted and he pronounced prosperity and to go for it. We don't get to change it. We don't get to decide what um, we want to do with what God has already said and already set forth in us. The next question that I had, and I just wanted to bring that out and just think about that, as humanity, we have to get back to God's truth, which is his word. Um, and the question I wrote is, why did God command them to be fruitful and multiply? And, of course, we know the answer to that. We know the answer so that the world continues. The earth continues as he designed it. If we stop being fruitful and stop multiplying, then we cease to exist. And so when the enemy deceives us or tries to deceive us into believing anything otherwise, it is not of God. It is not of God. Now that you've read and studied, so this is our mentoring moment, true identity, true identity. Now we build literacy and we make sure we understand our true identity. And so our mentoring moment here is now that you have read and studied Genesis 1, 11 through 25, as God created, he called what he created good. Even before creating mankind, he called what he created good. God created all of it with his purpose in mind. In scripture, when you look up the definition of good, it means well-pleasing and useful. Well-pleasing and useful. And so I have a journal entry for you. I have a journal um, topic for you to write on and to really talk about with your peers and talk about um, with your parents and in and, and, and your youth groups because it's so needed. Remember, good means well-pleasing and useful. That's how God, how his creation, and that's what he believes. That's what he says about us. So the journal question is, how can we honor God by seeing and responding to his creation as he does, which is good? And then the next part of that journal question is, what can you do to see yourself and your peers through the eyes of Christ, through the eyes of Christ, and again, as good, well-pleasing and useful? And my other part for you as you're writing is to repent to God for not treating or seeing yourself or his creation in this particular way. So I'm going to read the journal entry again. How can we honor God by seeing and responding to his creation as he was? Second part is, what can you do to see yourself and your peers through the eyes of Christ? Not in our judgmental um, stand, from our judgmental standpoint, but through the eyes of Christ, which it said, and God said it was good. And the other last part here is repent to God for not treating or seeing yourself or his creation in this particular way. 
This is so very important in our true identity moment because if we don't see ourselves as good as God has said it, and it is so, when God says it, it is so, then we can't walk in that true identity. We can't walk in that true identity because if we find ourselves stupid or dumb or um, other stupid or dumb or that they are poor or they don't have this or they don't have that, um, God says that his creation is good. What he created is good. And so we have to respond in that manner. And if we're not being convicted by, by God, we, we have to repent and begin to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ so that that conviction can come forth in us. And so we have to, in order to walk in that true identity, we have to see ourselves as God has already said and already commanded and already set forth from the beginning. And he said that it was good. Amen. And so we are getting ready to close out with our grammar fun. Our grammar fun at the end of our lesson is always um, some kind of activity for you to complete. And our grammar fun today, again, deals with Genesis 1 and 25, where it says, and God saw that it was good. His creation was good. So we're going back to that adjective there. So we're going to talk about that adjective. Good is an adjective that can be used in your writing to describe persons, places, and things. But we know that in the classroom, as we get ready to prepare for the Georgia Milestone and other tests across the world and across the nation, we want to use um, other adjectives that are synonyms for good, but to increase our vocabulary, those other words that mean the same as good. And so what I want you to do is search for some synonyms. In the dictionary, I want you to search for some synonyms for the word good. Amen. Synonyms are words that have the same meaning as good. You're going to make a list of those um, synonyms that you come up with, at least 10. And then I want you to create a poem. Now, God thought that his creation was good, but we know that God is good because he's the creator. So I want you to create a poem that describes God being a good father and a good creator using all ten of your synonyms that mean the same as good. And then you're going to share that with your peers, your youth group, your parents, and you can also email me if you would like. Um, I would love to hear from you at Denise M. Walker at um, Denise M. Walker Hope, I'm sorry, at gmail.com. That's Denise M. Walker Hope at gmail.com. That's my author email. And also, if you go to the youth website, um, you can also post in one of those areas where you can let me know that you have created your poetry of God being a good father and a good creator. Um, and the youth website is youth.hope-n-christ.com. That's youth.hope-n-christ.com. And I can't wait to hear from you. And my email again is Denise M. Walker Hope at gmail.com. And I thank you all for listening to today's lesson from Genesis 1, 11 through 25. And I pray that you have been blessed by understanding our essential question and our learning target, that God is the creator and God's purpose for us. It's his purpose, and it is good, and he saw us as good. And so we have to walk in that manner. Amen. We have to walk in that manner. And so we're going to close out in prayer, and then we will be done for today. Father God, we thank you, O oh God, for this time. We pray for your youth, O oh God. We pray for those, even adults, each and every one of us, God, that are listening, Lord God, that we will see ourselves as you see us. 
and we will see your creation as you see us. We will see every time we look at an animal and an insect, we see the beauty of who you are, oh God. We thank you, Father, that you alone are a good, good Father. And we bless you, oh God, for your word says, if our father and our mother forsake us, then you will, you will be there. You will lift us up. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you and you love us. We thank you for creating us in your image, in your likeness, oh God. We thank you for your love and kindness and your tender mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for, and also stay tuned um, in the month of February for our novel, our novel uh, from me, which is called Hannah's Hope. And Hannah's Hope is going to deal with some mentoring topics that deal with abuse um, in teen girls. So stay tuned for Hannah's Hope, and we will be doing some lessons and workshops as it relates to Hannah's Hope. And it will be found on Amazon. You'll be able to purchase it and share it with your friends and help them to understand that their true identity is still found in Christ no matter what they've been through and no matter what they're going through and that he can step through it all. Amen. Thank you for listening.